Good Time is a 2017 film directed by Josh and Benny Safdie. Connie removes his mentally challenged brother Nick from a therapy session. Connie has concerns that therapy isn't working for Nick, but he also has another motive in getting Nick out in the world. Connie wants to rob a bank and needs accomplices. They rob a bank for $65,000, but the bank teller put a dye pack in the bag. The cops grab Nick. Connie doesn't have the money to bail him out, and everything he tries backfires. Every scheme that Connie tries creates more problems, which results in new schemes, which results in new problems. He and a stranger named Ray try to find a stash of drugs to sell, but this results in the police getting involved, which results in Connie and Ray going into hiding in a security guard's apartment to do a drug deal, which results in more catastrophe ad nauseum. If the film is remarkable at anything, besides feeling so claustrophobic and stifling in its confines that I may have drowned while watching it, it's that it perfectly explains what it's like to exist within the American criminal justice system, a system that is so flawed that the World Justice Project's 2016 analysis showed that it is, quote, relatively weak inequality and is ranked behind countries like Estonia and the Czech Republic. America's criminal justice system is significantly better than many others, but for a country that prides itself on being the shining city on the hill, these flaws stand out in stark contrast to this claim. While the US scored within the top third of all countries, its performance was only average compared to other affluent nations. It also contained two key weaknesses. The first was the affordability of justice, meaning the difficulty for the poor to have a proper defense, and the presence of discrimination. Today I want to focus on affordability. Good Time shows us examples of these problems in action over the course of the film. The first failure of the American criminal justice system we see in the film is how your economic status influences how much time you spend in jail. This is noticeable straight away even before the trial, due to bail. If you have never been arrested, bail works like this. Sometimes when you're arrested, the court may ask for an amount of money as bond and then return it to you if you show up for trial. If you are ineligible or unable to post bail after being booked into custody, you will remain in jail until authorities transport you to your trial, which could take weeks. In good time, Connie only has a small portion of his stolen money left and needs another $10,000 for the bail bondsman. Nick is mentally disabled and will have an even more difficult time adjusting to life within the confines of jail. Connie needs to get Nick out immediately, but because he is poor, Nick remains locked up and in danger while awaiting his trial. American criminal justice disproportionately houses the poor in its prisons due to their inability to post bail. A millionaire who is arrested on white-collar crimes won't spend a day behind bars prior to trial, regardless of how high the bail is set. Nick, a mentally disabled young man with no resources except his criminal co-conspirator, is trapped until the slow-moving wheels of the criminal justice system turn and give him a trial date. Nick and Connie only have a few options here. The first is to wait in jail, but the consequences of this go beyond the dangers of just being in jail itself. If you don't show up for your job on Monday, you are probably going to be terminated. This sudden lack of a paycheck will further exacerbate the poverty of the family dealing with the arduous task of finding thousands upon thousands of dollars for bail. If you have no family to take care of your affairs while you're in jail, you could miss your rent payment or mortgage payment or any other important bill that needs to be paid promptly. That means that even if you make it to trial and are found not guilty, your life could be ruined anyway. Incarceration for even a short period of time could have devastating consequences. This lack of money for bail can also incentivize the defendant's co-conspirators to commit further crimes to pay for the bond. Connie, unable to secure the funds through a loan from his girlfriend, commits a series of other crimes to rescue Nick. He only has two choices if he is desperate to help his brother. He can either commit a crime to break him out of custody, which he attempts to do at the hospital, or he can commit crimes to make money to pay the bail bondsman. 
Either way, with no money, his only options made available to him through the legal system are illegal. Those who are charged with lesser crimes, misdemeanors and such, and can't afford bail are confronted with another option. Take a deal, plead guilty to get out, but suffer from that charge on your record for the rest of your life. Some take that option, but then must deal with the consequences that the black mark on your record carries with it, such as with employment. Unable to find employment, that person may then be incentivized to commit crimes to pay the bills, thus repeating the cycle. In some jurisdictions, charges on your record can affect your eligibility for government assistance, something a disabled person like Nick definitely needs. Nick doesn't even have this bad option though, he is charged with a felony and pleading guilty will probably result in significant jail time. Nick is being punished for a crime before he is convicted, and so is everyone else who can't make bail. Furthermore, even if Connie manages to get Nick out of jail prior to his trial, they still have no money for a proper defense attorney. The state has the prosecution and all the massive resources that one has when working on behalf of the government. The poor have the cheapest lawyers with the least resources or a court-appointed defender. This is another way in which the poor have a disadvantage when trying to defend themselves. According to the American Bar Association, researchers estimate that somewhere between 60 to 90 percent of criminal defendants need publicly funded attorneys. Due to the staggering number of Americans who can't afford their own lawyers, most public defenders are unable to meet this demand. This is due in part to the deluge of low-level charges and misdemeanor cases. Nick's charge is not a misdemeanor, but he must suffer all the same. And that's not his only problem. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, prosecutors often bring charges against defendants that are far higher than warranted by the facts of the case, and public defenders simply do not have the time or the resources to assertively negotiate with prosecutors in plea discussions. This means defendants are then left to accept unfair plea deals rather than risk trials that may leave them behind bars for much, much longer, regardless of their guilt or innocence. Now in the movie, Nick definitely committed the crime, but a good attorney with lots of time and resources would be able to argue that Nick's disability makes him a special case, and perhaps not as culpable as his brother Connie. According to The Ark, a disability rights organization, individuals with cognitive disabilities are frequently used by other criminals to assist in crimes without understanding their involvement or the consequences of their involvement. They may also have a strong need to be accepted and may agree to help with criminal activities in order to gain friendship. Even worse, many cognitively disabled individuals unintentionally give misunderstood responses to officers, which increases their vulnerability to arrest, incarceration, and possible execution, even if they committed no crime. A good lawyer is needed to help Nick. A public defender, on the other hand, would have his hands full. But what about cases in which the defendant is 100% innocent? Heaven help you if you are both wrongfully arrested and poor. In most states, you can actually be billed by a public defender, which sounds like the opposite of that job description. So, when arrested, the poor face added challenges pre-trial due to bail and added challenges during the trial due to overworked public defenders. But what about after that? What about their eventual release from jail, perhaps years later after serving their sentence? Well, the national average for recidivism is roughly 50%, which means America is failing about half the time. Ray, a character Connie meets, tells the story about being released from jail and immediately scoring acid and dealing drugs again. If Ray is like most other felony drug convicts, he may be banned from receiving a lot of government food benefits, which means his poverty is now worse than it was before his conviction. Some states limit these benefits, and some states outright ban you for life. Convicts like Ray also have trouble getting access to public housing. He's on his own without a safety net and few legal options to make ends meet. 
Research into this matter shows that the ban causes recidivism among drug dealers. Also, many drug convicts are sent back to jail for minor parole violations like missing a meeting. When we are introduced to Ray, he is furious that he was taken out of the hospital against his will, because this might violate his parole. It wasn't even his fault, but he is still in violation. Released convicts who try to get their lives back together and get jobs don't always have the option of having control over their work schedule, and if their work schedule is in conflict with a parole meeting, they have a difficult choice to make. Risk losing the job and end up in even more abject poverty, or risk the parole officer reporting you and sending you back to jail. Another way the poor suffer more from this system is that in some states, released convicts must pay fees for parole services. That's money that recently released convicts, who have just served their debt to society, might not have. Ray, in order to prove to his parole officer he isn't selling drugs, might have to sell drugs to pay his fees. Now, as for the main character, Look, I do not want to paint Connie as a misunderstood, altruistic Robin Hood figure. I mean, he does some awful things in the movie that have nothing to do with making money to pay his bills. However, Good Time is shockingly accurate in its portrayals of the lives of poor people who are accused of or convicted of crimes. Everything that Connie does to improve his station backfires, or has a negative side effect which forces him to resolve this new situation, which backfires, which forces him to resolve this next situation. And with no other way to do so except for crime, it perpetuates itself forever. In the end, the final resolution is that Connie gives up. Now, whether he did this to maybe cut a deal and help his brother or not, the movie does not say. Maybe he's just tired. Tired of being kicked around by the system that is more interested in punishing him than reforming him. I know I would be. Hi everyone, if you like what I do, please click on the orange Patreon link below. That's how this show happens. It's also the only way to request an episode. Also, please like, share, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so that you never miss an episode. I'll see you next week.